Ladies and gentlemen, over the past few weeks, a new star has emerged in the chess world. Please meet Jansaya Abdumalik from Kazakhstan. Jansaya is 21 years old and she just convincingly won the FIDE Women's Grand Prix in Gibraltar. Jansaya grew up in Almaty in Kazakhstan and she learned the game of chess at five years old. She went on to win like every single gold medal possible in the scholastic category. She got her Grandmaster Norm, her first one in the World Open actually in Philadelphia in 2017. And she had all of her norms done. To get the title, you need three norms and the rating. So she entered this Gibraltar tournament not yet having that rating, but she needed just that final component to become a Grandmaster. And Jansaya was actually a replacement because of some of the Chinese players having travel restrictions. So sometimes you need talent, but you also need the opportunity. And in this video, I'm going to take you through some of her most impressive victories in this tournament as we congratulate her on not just becoming a Grandmaster, but just the 38th woman of all time to get the Grandmaster title. Timestamps on the video player, here we go. So we kick things off in the second round of the Grand Prix. Jansaya has the black pieces versus Elizabeth. I would say Piets. That's how an American would pronounce it, but I think it's pronounced Pietz in German. But anyway, e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, and Jansaya plays this e4, e5 stuff with black. That's basically the repertoire of a chess professional. Uh, Bishop b5, Rue Lopez, uh, trying to go for a Berlin endgame potentially. Anti Berlin. Uh, bishop c5, c3, d6, and of course these are all long games, these are just, you know, so we all know these are games being played over the board, uh, classical chess, and here Elizabeth plays a move, which is not the most popular move in the position, she plays bishop to a4, uh, which looks relatively harmless, but, uh, you know, the idea is to go back to c2, white basically just wants to voluntarily retreat, maybe play d4, and in the long run this bishop will have access to this diagonal, it's not a very popular move, it's much more common for white to do other things, uh, so now we get to see how Jansaya handles a slight opening surprise, potentially, uh, and her understanding of her the positions that she gets. H6, because you guys also always have these questions, like, what do I do in an opening when my opponent plays something I don't recognize? So H6, number one, prevent anything from coming to G5. The bishop is traded. Okay, great. Uh, we have a transformation of structure. White has the open F file, potentially. This is a little bit of a weakness. And now uh, A5. The idea of a5 is to prevent white from ever expanding on this side of the board, and um, there's actually a, a hidden idea behind a5, which is actually completely fascinating. Um, it, it actually shows you Jansaya's foresight. Okay, so knight d2, now knight e7. Why knight e7? Well, you're rendering again this bishop useless. First of all, black has an idea to potentially just expand on this side of the board with the pawns. But actually, as you will see in a moment, that's not the idea at all. So white plays knight to h4. The point of knight to h4 is to activate the rook, activate the queen. Uh, maybe you'll sacrifice, and so Shansaya plays knight g6. Now again, traditionally speaking, this is kind of a damaging of a structure. However, you meet white on this file, your king is completely safe, and you're, you're more than fine. And this actually is a big weakness for white, because you'll play c6, queen, b6, and it's very, it can be very difficult as you begin expanding to defend that e3 pawn, whereas this pawn is not really weak whatsoever. Um, so Elizabeth plays knight f5. And now we see d5. So again, striking in the center. Uh, opportunity to do that. This trade will always benefit black um, because e3 weakness. Bishop can always take on, on f5 as well to stop protecting that pawn. Um, and so white plays queen f3. And now we see the point of a5. Are you ready? Like four moves ago when the move a5 was played, everything is kind of close. But now that the position's transformed, Jansaya plays rook a6. <laughs> You're like, what? <laughs> what? What is this? Well, the point is simple. Uh, in a few moves, first of all, she plays rook b6. So she she actually makes white make a decision. One of these pieces is going to have to come to defend this pawn. Like, either the pawn's going to move up, white chooses to push, but now this is destabilized, and now knight h7. And your rook will actually make it across. And her rook did make it to f6. All of a sudden, this rook, from God knows where, has joined the party. And now you've got an extra attacker. That's not traditional. That's not supposed to happen. When she played the move a5, she had foreseen all of this. Um, literally. I mean, I, I didn't ask her. But, you know, the knight jumped back. This knight jumped back. d5. All expanding in the center. All part of her plan. And she kind of did that. And now the rook is on f6. Okay, now white needs to react, right? White goes back with the queen. Ronsaya plays c6. And now that the rook has crossed the bridge, you can shut the bridge down. The rook doesn't need to... And, 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 right, the rook doesn't need to go anywhere, and now this bishop is on the verge of getting trapped. So white plays b4, uh, but b4 after takes, takes... Remember I told you guys about queen b6 earlier, now, now you just got targets. 
So king h1, white decides to sack the pawn. You say, why, why did white do that? Why didn't white just defend the pawn? It's not that simple. Um, I take the knight. Now you lose a guard on this, and I'm still pinning you. So for example, this, I have knight f4. So again, it, it's not just the weakness of the pawn. It's, it's more like the weakness of the position. You utilize the pawn as a tool to break down your opponent's position. It's not necessarily about winning the pawn. So pawn, uh, queen takes b4, and okay, we've now played 21 moves, uh, and white is, just, uh, white is just down a pawn, right? And so now it's like, okay, well, how, well how do I win this position? Okay, let's trade a pair of rooks. Let me activate my bishop, which I haven't activated yet. My knight on h7 is a little passive. I'll get it back into the game uh, in a few moves. Um, bishop takes d5. I'm trying to trade some pieces. I'm not making this trade. This is just an awful trade, actually. Right? N not all trades are created equal in chess. I mean, you need you need to make certain trades and not others. So knight f5, b5. See, the queen went up a square to kick the knight out. Okay, great. Knight's got to move. Knight decides to move in. Now Jean Sayed takes. Uh, and of course, if white were to just take back, white would be two pawns down. So white plays this move, trying to pin... And that is a legitimate pin. You will probably win back the, the piece. And now Jansaya is bringing her knights. Now she's still the pawn up. These knights are, they look scary. Th those are the kind of knights, like, since they're tied together and they're standing near your pieces, you're, you're really scared you're going to blunder something. But in chess, you shouldn't be afraid of ghosts. Just play rook d8 and, I mean, you're just straight up threatening to take. Like, for example, like this, of course you take. I just hope we're clear. Two knights are definitely worth a rook. Like, this is a very easily winning position now. So long as you don't hang a piece in one move, which nobody's going to do at this level. And now you take d3, and I mean, it's all over. You take this, and white does something here called going for aggressive counterplay. Like, you're down three pawns. Um, you need to go for aggressive counterplay. Try to attack the king. Don't be afraid of ghosts. Everything is covered. Every one of these squares is completely covered. Um, rook d2, and actually, it's, it's black who's calling the shots. Like, black is going for mate. And she does that. She threatens mate. Um, and, uh, you know, you've only got two attacking pieces right now. Now this knight, which triumphantly used to be on h7, comes into e4. Uh, you're threatening to jump in potentially to these two squares. Knight f2 check, king h2. And now a very, a very nice move to end the game. Uh, a move that seemingly does nothing. And um, it, 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 it very much does something indeed. The king is on h2. I want you to be able to attack it with the queen. So what do you play here, folks? You play e4. You activate a piece by moving another piece. Now, at that level, easy move. But I just want you to understand these little subtle moves, right? Like, that's how we get better at the game. Because we, we don't just think, oh, I need to activate my queen to get to the king. No, I, I, I can activate my other pieces. All my pieces work together. And in this position, um, after queen b8 covering queen e5, queen takes f5. Uh, white resigned. Uh, very, very nice game. I mean, w what to say? White plays a slight opening surprise. Black reacts well, and then just from this point forward, to come up with this idea A5, maybe Jean Sai has seen it in previous games, that's generally how title players work, they have these games kind of embedded in their memory, but just a very nice move, very nice plan, caught White completely off guard, very unique idea, uh, and, uh, and so with that we'll move to the next game. Now this game is from round number five, uh, and this one is, is also kind of an opening thing, but, but less about being surprised and more about having your own solid preparations. So Jean Saya plays e4, uh, Antoinette Stefanova plays e5, Grandmaster from, I believe, Bulgaria, I hope I have that correct, and we have the scotch opening. Takes, takes, and here the main line is knight f6 and bishop c5, uh, but uh, black plays queen f6 which actually is a very trendy move. Queen f6 is super popular right now at the high levels, uh, and it's scoring quite well for black. I mean, it's scoring totally, you know, acceptably for black, and this is black's idea. Queen f6 to target the knight, the knight moves, and now the, the queen comes here and attacks this. Now here you gotta know what you're doing with white. White plays f3. To the untrained eye, that move looks idiotic. First of all, Ben Feingold twitched somewhere, because you're not supposed to play that move. Uh, but why wouldn't you just develop a piece? Well, you can't develop your bishop because you lose g2, right? You can't go here, probably, because this is actually what black wants. Like, black wants an active developing move to hit your knight to your king. So you play you play f3, and black has to just develop. So bishop d6, and right up until here, this position has been reached before. Uh, and uh, here, there, there's kind of something funny. If white just develops bishop e3, black can play this shocking bishop takes h2. And it's still completely fine for white, as long as you don't take because then you would blunder a, a rook, and that's bad. Hanging a rook on move 9 is probably not going to win you any tournaments. Uh, so white plays f4. Now the move f4, according to my database, is a novelty. So Shansaya clearly had, had, had prepared this, but so had her opponent. She reacted correctly, or maybe her opponent just reacted correctly over the board. But it's funny, you just negate your development, 
And uh, because the bishop hasn't moved here, you can go f4. And basically, you're trying to say, look, you have all these pieces out, but I have pawns. Pawns will defeat pieces in the middle of the board. Because where are your pieces going to go? You can't sacrifice them for my pawns, right? I would win material. So f4. This shows Jensai's preparation. Unless she invented this over the board, which I doubt. Now bishop b4, now f5, and now queen f6. So the queen's kind of trapped in the middle of the board. Why well, just plays bishop d3? Whoa, 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 whoa. Bishop d3. You're just going to sacrifice this? And basically, that's what you're doing. Yes. Uh, you have something worked out in this position. Takes, takes, takes. That after sacrificing a pawn, you are just better. Like, you have something here. And quite frankly, that could have been it. Like, this could have been Jensai's prep. And she, she had this position in her notes. Uh, and even though black is up a pawn, black's position looks pretty miserable. I mean, these pawns are very strong. If you can ever land your bishop on this diagonal, black is dead. If you can reroute your knight to d5 or to g4, where it will hit the queen and push through, black is dead. Very tough position, it looks like. And so for that reason, Antoinette played this move. She just went back, uh, I guess looking for queen h4 check. But the problem is now queen h5. Black wastes one move too long in the opening, and all of a sudden, bishop g5 is on the cards. Uh, and bishop g5 arrived a move later, two moves later. The knight is hit, but you counterattack the queen. The queen comes here, but just bishop f4. And okay, you think they're going to repeat moves, right? Uh, re repetition. No, no, no. Golden rule. If you have a lead in development, and you are castled, and your opponent's king is still stuck in the center, folks, what do you do down the middle of the board? It's principal chess. E5. Sometimes moves that look impossible become possible. Why is this move so strong? Because you clear the square for another one of your pieces, just like we saw in the last game. You see, when I prepare for these videos, I try to make concepts overlap. I would love that. So E5 is a clearance move for the knight to the middle. Black has to go here, now knight E4, and this queen's trapped. Queen's trapped. It's got nowhere to go. So Stefanova has to sacrifice, well, it's a little bit hard to see, but Knight d6 check is the point, and now bishop f5. So she has to sacrifice some material. She does get a couple of pieces, but once the dust settles, we have this position where Jansai is only technically up one point of material. In fact, after this, she's up zero. Material is completely equal. Black has three extra pawns, and black also has two knights. So two knights and three extra pawns for a queen. However, white is completely winning. Why? And, well, Jensai says, I don't even want to play the game. Let me just bring the queen back. You should just, you know, resign. I'm setting up for the next game. No, she's going for d6. So black has to play this move. Uh, and now bishop d5. So another golden rule of thumb. When you have a queen versus stuff, okay? Queen versus rook knight, queen versus whatever. There's a couple of things you need to follow. Trades are generally not preferred. Your queen needs help, okay? Your queen's like LeBron on the Lakers. Uh, and, uh, you know, Anthony Davis is injured. It's just, it's not going to work. Or, you know what? Better analogy, Damian Lillard, Portland Trailblazers. Okay. Um, queen needs help. That's what the queen needs. And you want to take off the pawn. So, so, so she wins the pawn. Now black plays this. And you need to suppress your opponent's development as much as possible. And the best way to do that is to attack. Okay, don't let your opponent get fully consolidated. If black gets all the pieces out, you're going to feel the presence of those pieces. So queen e1 forces this move. Now black is playing defensively. Now what did I say? You need to force the issue here. b4. Now black has to move the rook. c3. And you would think, oh, well, what, I mean, she's letting... No, no, she's not letting anything happen. Um, this rook is trapped. And like, for example, if the rook had gone all the way back here, you would have just kept going with b5. Or you would have taken on d5. And this is pinned. And uh, the rooks see each other. So the initiative continues. If takes, takes. You cannot take the bishop because of queen g7. I mean, you're probably getting blown off the board. And you don't even need to do this yet because you can play bishop takes f7 check. So if you forget about your hanging bishop, you might still win the game. But don't forget about your hanging bishop and play queen a1. Uh, bishop f7 and then queen a1. And so uh, it was in this position, b5, that black resigned. Because black's knights are just... You're going to lose one. Now, black could have played something like king to d8, let's say, to keep this protected. But king to d8, I mean, I have rook f7. Black just basically, like, think about this. Black played the whole game without moving a bishop. Black also kind of played the whole game without moving the king and the rook. I understand you castled, but... So, she completely demolishes this game uh, with a nice opening surprise and idea. And now we move to the next game that I'm going to show you. I believe this is from round number seven. This game was completely insane. Like, I mean, head to toe... I don't, I don't even know what that means in the context of chess. Um, let's look at this game from her perspective again. She's playing one of the strongest Georgian women, uh, Nana Zagnidze. 
So we have d4, d5, and all right, let's slow it down. We have a London. White plays a London. Everybody chill. In fact, it's a London where black takes on d4 very early. So we're not even going to have a lot of, like, tension. Black kind of, in fact, mirrors the setup, plays this queen c8 to protect the b7 pawn. Um, here, a, a move that I play a lot is uh, knight h4. When I have white here, I always try to get this bishop. Uh, in this game, uh, Zaniza doesn't do that. She just focuses on development and plays this move c4. Okay, so she plays the move c4. Uh, Shansaya takes it and plays queen d7 to maintain the defense of her pawn, but to get the queen off the file of the rook. Now, oftentimes in London's, you are kind of at the mercy of white. Like, if white wants to play aggressive, like with knight e5, all right, we could have some fun. Um, but if white doesn't want to do that, it, it could be very difficult to create play. So here's Shansaya, thinks for a while, plays queen d8. And queen d8 is a is a massive experiment. Massive experiment. Essentially, you're saying, oh no, my pawn. You're going full Eric Rosen here. Um, the Nidza just takes it. It's a free pawn. And now, folks, all hell breaks loose. Uh, Black here can play the very chill bishop to e4, lining up this. Uh, and, you know, this is under attack. The bishop can drop back to d5, or even the knight can come to d5. But Zanzaya lives a dangerous life. And this is round seven, right? So you're already in first place. You're having a good tournament. You're feeling yourself. That's how it works. You feel, you know, you feel good. You're like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for it. So you play knight takes d4. Now, okay. Okay. Um, you win your pawn back. You're threatening knight takes bishop, which is a fork, okay? Uh, complete insanity begins to ensue. Um, white should play bishop f1. White should play bishop f1. But it's nowhere near clear. Um, it, if white were to play bishop f1, uh, black would go knight to e4. And if you go for my knight, which is pinned to my queen, I'm just checking my notes here, that's why I'm looking over here, you would go knight c5. The queen is almost trapped, so the queen has to go here. And now, knight to d3, covered by three pieces. But because the bishop hits the queen, the queen's gotta go somewhere. So it would go maybe to a4, and now it looks like a repetition of moves might be possible with knight c5, but there is queen a5. And furthermore, if you take the rook, there is bishop takes d4, and the knight is trapped. But even that's not the end of the story, because there might be f6 to hit the knight. And then if the knight goes here to attack the queen, you would sack for it, take, take, and now this knight would be able to get out and go back to b4. But computer still thinks white is better here, despite black being a pawn up, and it thinks that because black's position is pretty scatterbrained all over the place. Um, but knight takes d4, white thought for a while and played king f1, to, so that knight takes bishop is not possible, because of course you just lose the queen. Uh, knight takes bishop is not a check. But now we have bishop to e4, okay? Like I told you, this game's completely nuts. So bishop e4, queen moves, now bishop to c5, all of a center, uh, all of a sudden the center is glued completely shut, uh, and well, I mean, what are you gonna do? So white plays bishop back to e3, targeting. And now Shansaya plays this move. And she just has an armada of pieces standing directly in the center of the board doing their best Tetris piece formation. It's not even clear what the threat is. I mean, don't you just lose yourself in, in the music the moment you want it? You better let it... Sorry. Um, knight, knights here target both bishops. I mean, the queen can come out this way. I mean, f6, f5, f4, I don't know. But white plays bishop h5 to target the f7 pawn. And it's actually funny because after takes, takes, Shansaya straight up just let her take it. She was like, yeah, go ahead. It's even if it's check. And White was like, uh, are you sure? Are you sure? And now Rook takes d4. Apparently the best move here for White was this move, where everything barely hangs on to each other, but Black would have played Rook c7 to try to get rid of this and then take that. Because the knight is something we call overloaded. It can't guard both things. But here there is the shocking computer move. What computer move, folks? You watch enough of my videos. H4! And you can't take it. If you take it, then I go here. And then if you give me a check, and then, well, of course, if takes, then takes, right? If king e2, and you take this rook, all right, that's nice. Now I take your bishop. Now I'm winning. Yeah, my king's out in the open. Doesn't matter. I'm safe. Yeah, I mean, the computer is just terrible, right? It'll just suggest these moves. So instead of knight to g4, uh, Zenitza took immediately. But now we have this, 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 this. And what's going on? Black is just an exchange up. <laughs> black is an exchange up like here somehow after all the dust settled in the tactical complications black here has to play one move and one move only and um the rook is hanging so where do you move the rook well the king's right there right so here and uh rook c5 queen e3 
And rook goes back to c2. Rook a8. Very nice move. The queen's not hanging because of the pin. I don't know if you guys realize that. The queen's not hanging. Queen hasn't been hanging. It's not hanging. And rook e6. Look at that move. Danger levels. John Sai has seen the video. Rook e3. Rook a6. And, I mean, it, less than 30 moves again with black. And she she invites positions like this, you know? She 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 invites positions like this where she will play knight takes d4 uh, and all hell breaks loose. And it's a tactical fight. I think in the modern day of chess, we look at games like this and we go, well, the computer said... No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the computer said. Because at the end of the day, chess is a battle of two people who are calculating positions and evaluating them constantly and then coming back and making decisions. And if you make less inaccurate decisions, then you're going to win the game. Now, um, final game that I'm going to show you uh, is Her with the White Pieces. This is later in the tournament. Uh, and this game, really, the, the, the key here is perseverance. Perseverance and uh, mental fortitude. So we have another E4, E5. And like I said, this whole video is kind of just demonstrating all parts of her playing style, right? So A3, pretty non-standard opening. Because black has put a bishop on kind of a passive square. And I mean, this whole thing is just a little bit... It's like very solid, right? And uh, normally white has pawn on c3 to try to play pawn to d4. But in this case, you're just fighting for this d5 square. So that's why you put bishop and knight like this. You played a3 so you could prevent your bishop from getting trapped uh, on that side of the board. And also maybe to play b4, which is what she does in this game. And rook e1, and now knight d5. So we have uh, knight b8 to try to play c6. And she goes back to c3 to try to transform the structure. So she can double her pawns, but just get a death grip on, on, on d5, right? So knight c6, bishop e6, rook e6, knight d5. Let's try this again, but without the bishops. The knight goes back to e7. You might recognize this kind of knight maneuver with pawn to c6, maybe, from Jonsaya's game herself, where she transferred the rook a couple of games ago. But there, there's a big difference here, and, and the big difference is the fact that... Um, after this trade, this rook is never making it to the party. And this rook could make it to the party if black were to play knight f4 and rook g6. That, that, that is very much a thing. Um, black decides to go to h4 in the game, and now she plays knight to h2. Something similar that she did with the black pieces. Maybe not the most accurate move, but the truth is that if you make this trade and then maybe do something like this, this, according to the computer, is better for white, but it's not so... I mean... Optically, it's kind of difficult to, to envision that because this bishop is very passive. I mean, this bishop's also not, not the best, but I mean, this just looks kind of annoying. Um, but computers are going to computer. What are you going to do? Knight h2 takes, and now this move g3 to kick out the knight. So the knight goes back, and now bishop d4. And I would say that uh, right here is kind of the most important moment when black plays this move f5. The doubling on the e file, and it's an invitation to go take, 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 take. And we have a trans we have transformation of the position into queen knight bishop versus queen knight bishop. The biggest imbalance of the position is the pawn structure. We are now in an endgame. And this is why this game is called Perseverance. Because you're not going to win all your games in 28 moves and your opponents aren't going to hang queens out of opening preparation. Sometimes you're going to have to dig deep and create stuff when the computer is out there screaming at you, there is no stuff. Um, you don't know that there is no stuff. You're just playing chess. Um, so, king g2. Knight e5, bishop f2. White consolidates near the king. And now we have queen e6 hitting the pawn. So white takes on a7. Queen c4, queen b7, and queen e2. Black has sacrificed one of the queen side pawns. Now black is a pawn down, but look at this. You're really going to tell me that this little lunchbox of pieces over here is leaving a strong impression on anybody? What is white's biggest asset in this position, folks? If you said anything besides the A pawn, hey, pay attention, all right? I know some of you don't even, like, look, look at the screen. Y'all got me in the background. Pay attention. The A pawn is white's biggest asset, all right? It's a pass pawn. It's just got a direct line to, to the end. What black is going to try to do is play moves like knight d3 and go after this bishop. So c5 by black. Very nice idea to disconnect the queen from the bishop. We have takes and knight c4. Now, you can argue that black should have taken first. Black decides to go knight c4, but now queen b3. This, th this is an annoying move. You see, you stop knight e3 by paralyzing it. Now black plays d5. Black, black is all in. Black has sacrificed the second pawn. And is trying to take, utilizing this pin. So what does white do to prevent that? Chess is simple sometimes. King g1. King h7, a4. d4, c6. I mean, you got, you got past pawns, right? 
You just gotta evaluate that your king is not dead yet. Okay, great, let's just push the pawns. But now bishop d6. Okay, f4. Three pawn moves. A, C, F. All right? Like J Street Metro Tech for my New York City people. Knight E3. Are you threatening anything? No. There's no threat. That's actually the crazy part. None of these moves are a threat. If you're confused why F1's not a threat, it's because of this hero knight. Right? So Queen B1 check. But you would think, wait, isn't Queen B1 check kind of scary? Like, isn't there like pawn to D3? Yeah, but now Queen E1 is the dagger. You trade pieces. And you stop the pawn and you're just up too many pawns in the endgame, right? So King H8, now this, now this. But now, now as time is dwindling, Jansaya transforms the position, but in the process, it slightly inaccurately. And we get a three on two endgame. This didn't necessarily have to happen, but this is what happens. And this is why I call this perseverance. This is move 45. Now you got to start all over. How the heck... Are you going to win three on two? First of all, you never agree to a draw here, ever. I mean, the only way you lose this game is on time, by having a heart attack, or by losing your queen. So, all three of those are relatively unlikely, right? So, queen f2. Uh, someone watching is like, <laughs> never trust me with a queen. I only, <laughs> I only got the queen and three pawns. I'll still find a way to lose it. Also, folks, making a queen trade in an endgame like this um, is sometimes going to be winning and sometimes not going to be winning. So, in this 3-on-2 this endgame is a win. This 3-on-2 pawn endgame is a win, but sometimes, depending on how your pawns are positioned or if this king is super active, it won't be a win. So, black is trying to avoid the queen trade. White would like a queen trade um, and wants to advance the pawns. Uh, here, the computer gives an absolutely cold-blooded move, which is h5. Uh, on low depth, it thinks that sacrificing this pawn and getting this 3-on-1 endgame is a draw because by destroying white's pawn structure, you kill white's forward mobility. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. But black plays king h8. Basically, black took the approach of I'm going to give you checks and I'm going to sit and wait. And so Jansaya, this is okay, great. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not scared. Queen g1, maybe it's coming. You can't check me anymore. You can't check me anymore. And now this move, queen b1. Um, and in this position, queen b1 is a fatal mistake. It's very difficult to see why. Uh, black should have played king g8 according to the machine. But even, even on, on king g8, I have some suspicion uh, computer will find like little tricks and, and, and things to draw it for black, but uh, very tough for a human. So queen b1, which also seems relatively, I mean, the same. You want to play queen f5 check or something. You want to stay over here. There is a really savage winning idea here by white, which Jean Saya spots immediately. Uh, it has nothing to do with checking the king, but it has to do with making the right move at the right second to take away black's space and breathing. f5 and g6. These two pawn pushes kill black circulation doesn't matter you cannot check my king anymore and i'm just going queen h5 queen h7 queen h8 queen g7 like right now for example well, queen a you would play queen takes queen but i would go check 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 and take this and the game is over and if you put had put your queen here i would still do it because it's still winning um so f5 and g6 very surgical and uh we get one more spite check on c8 king h4 having the cerebral right ability to realize there are no checks here queen h5 is still on the cards by the way queen h5 was made possible by advancing the pawn and that is actually why black had to put the king on g8 because you needed to anticipate this whole idea and black missed that and so jansaya shows uh with four games that i've shown you in this video an ability to uh overcome some opening surprise and understand the position better than her opponent coming up with a nice original idea very strong opening preparation in that second game uh in that third game with the black pieces the ability to create chaos out of nowhere right uh and make the la not make the last mistake of the game make the penultimate potentially inaccuracy of the game inviting those wild complications against one of the strongest performers of the event uh, and in this game, I mean, 60 move end game grind, starting from scratch several times over the game, over the course of the game, and kind of keeping level headed. So, um, with this, Jansaya gained like 35 rating points. And to summarize, she's now about 2505, I believe, is her live rating. She got eight and a half points out of 11. She played 11 rounds, uh, f f six wins and five draws, six wins and five draws, undefeated. She's now the fifth highest rated player in Kazakhstan. She's always represented the Kazakhstan women's national team, but she might be strong enough to play on the open team. I mean, I, I don't know. It's, comp it's completely her call. Uh, but uh, she's obviously the first woman 
to become a grandmaster in the history of Kazakhstan. Uh, there's another uh, woman in Kazakhstan, Dinara Sadwakasova. She's also very close, and I believe the two of them are, are close friends, but I, I, I don't know that. I just see them at tournaments. Um, so congratulations to her. Massive accomplishment. Only the 38th woman to do it, and hopefully many more in the future. Um, and, you know, hopefully th there is already a school in Kazakhstan named after her, uh, which I believe she opened some, some several years ago. So hopefully she continues to inspire the next generation. And um, listen, if I got to be this kind of news destination for you, not just for the top players, but also players that are just breaking into the GM ranks uh, and, and, and setting history in, in their countries all over the world, I'm more than happy to do that. Uh, so hopefully you enjoyed the video. Congratulations once again to her. And uh, yeah, as always, go get involved in the comments. Love to read what you all have to say, and I will see you in the next video. Peace out. Get out of here.